justice within and beyond law, the actions of civil society, we have three presentations in regard of civil society problematics as well as the problematics of justice, transitional justice in the post-Soviet period. The author of first presentation, Nadia Nedzelsky, is associated professor and chair of the International Studies Department in, at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. She is specialist in the areas of human and minority rights, comparative nationalism, and transitional justice. She co-edited with Levine Stan the uh, third volume Encyclopedia of Transitional Justice, and uh, some articles and some monography uh, in the context of transitional justice. Uh, Nadia Nedzelska is the very famous researcher, and you can start. Oh, whoa, okay. <laughs> that seems too loud. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, and thank you also to the organizers for inviting me. This has been a real pleasure. So the guiding question for my paper is, is there any reason to assume that civil society contributions to transitional justice lead to good rather than evil? Slovakia's unusual approach to transitional justice raises this question. After splitting with the Czech Republic, it did not carry out lustration, and it prosecuted only one person for communist era crimes, as you saw in Mr. Labiak's um, slide, giving him a suspended sentence. Slovakia thus largely lacked perpetrator-focused justice. In addition, Slovakia has yet to come to terms with its World War II history as a Nazi-sponsored state that willingly participated in the Holocaust and defenders of that state now occupy prominent positions in the state's nation's memory institute. In important ways, this transitional justice profile is due to the influence of two members of Slovak civil society, the associations of former political prisoners and the media. In this paper, I explore some implications of the Slovak case for theorizing civil society's relationship to transitional justice. I argue that it is important to revise certain normative assumptions that commonly underlie discussion of civil society and to expand and complicate the set of possible relationships between state and civil society in transitioning societies. <coughs> the concept of civil society I consider here concerns a realm of societal activity that belongs strictly neither to the state nor to the private sphere. Many scholars hold high expectations for its constituent associations. For example, Klaus Offa sees them as, quote, establishing contexts conducive to a political communication that, through sufficiently convincing arguments, readies citizens to engage in responsible behavior, end quote. Thus, Zala Volchich and Olivera Simic note, quote, the implicit normative element in almost all anal analyses of civil society based on a peaceful, moral, and idealistic vision, which essentially stands in opposition to uncivil society. <coughs> Within the literature on transitional justice, one of the few studies that explores civil society's role in relationship to the broader theoretical literature is David Backer's. It is an important contribution, but at the same time, the types of civil society groups he discusses and his expectation that a strong civil society contribution to a supportive state will strengthen democracy seems to assume that the contribution will be compatible with both transitional justice and democracy. <coughs> also, <coughs> excuse me, he leaves out the independent media as a player. Overall, only a few authors note the participation of intolerant or problematic actors, for example, Lavinia Stan and Monica Chibano concerning actors in the Romanian case. This brings me to the Slovak case. In the post-communist period, Slovakia's main transitional justice methods have been file access and restitution, defined broadly to include rehabilitation. And civil society has played an important role. Beginning with the former, political will for file access was long in coming. In 2001, the journal Critica and Context asked why there had been such a profound lack of interest in Slovakia about secret police-related issues. The following summer, a bill proposed by former dissident Jan Langos set up the nation's memory institute, 
where people can access the files, and which was also tasked with investigating and publicizing the darker aspects of the state's fascist and communist pasts. In late 2004, under Longush's leadership, it began publishing the secret police registers online. These revelations, which included many famous names, sparked the highest level of public interest and media discussion about the past since the state's founding. <coughs> Shortly after the online revelations, an opinion poll, poll found that 82% of respondents, quote, considered it correct for people who are filed as STB agents to resign from public office and leave public life. Thank you. <laughs> This is striking, as 1990s opinion polls had shown relatively low interest among Slovaks in decommunization. In June 2006, the Nation's Memory Institute suffered a tragedy when Langos died in a car crash. Discussion of the past nevertheless continued. While the Nation's Memory Institute and file access was clearly essential, the societal implications were very much in the hands of the media, as um, Sagan also noted. As a means of transitional justice, file access requires active engagement with the information that goes beyond its release. It re needs evidence gathering, contextualizing, question, questioning, discussion, debate, and assessment. The combined efforts of the state via the Nation's Memory Institute and civil society have moved Slovakia from silence and seeming indifference to active and continuing discussion. Arguably, neither the state nor civil society could have done it alone. The other main Slovak transitional justice method is restitution. <coughs> because state su uh, support of the victim's ability to achieve it, especially during the 1990s, was not robust, civil society assistance and advo advocacy became important and came especially from two groups, the Confederation of Slovak Political Prisoners, the KPVS, and the Political Prisoners Union of Anti-Communist Resistance, PVZPKO. The groups began as one association in 1990, the KPVS, but split in 1999. These civil society associations play all of the transitional justice roles Backer identifies, such as representation and advocacy in policy debates, providing victims legal and financial help, working for public recognition of victims and the wrongs done them, and collecting victim and family testimonies. At the same time, these civil societies have been controversial because of their stance regarding the fascist World War II Slovak state. International attention was drawn to this issue when, after Langos died, the far-right nationalist Slovak National Party, in the governing coalition at the time, put PVZPKO chairman Arpard Tarnoji forward as a candidate to head the nation's memory institute. In response, the Central Union of Jewish Religious Communities sent a letter to Slovak parliament pointing to his participation in the unveiling of a commemorative plaque to Josef Kirschbaum, a key wartime state, state ideologist, and the PVZPKO's publication of its monthly Svedetstvo, whose subtitle is Journal of Taboo Facts, of an article celebrating Odomar Kubala, a radical anti-Semite and chief of the Hlinka Guards, the wartime domestic militia that headed the deportations of Slovak Jews, calling him, quote, a, a great patriot, a heroic fighter for Slovak freedom and state independence, end quote. The Jewish communities concluded that, quote, nominating such a person as Tarnoji would be a gross insult to everything that Lan Jan Langos stood for, end quote. The Political Prisoners Association's contribu contributions to transitional justice need to be assessed in the context of Slovakia's struggle over the wartime state's legacy, which has been contentious since the communist regime's fall. After the KPVS and PVZPKO split in 1999, the latter has continued um, to attract attention for its support of the wartime state. For example, <coughs> in mid-1995, Peter Bielek, a member of the editorial board of Svedetstvo and the PVZPKO's representative in other matters, published a piece on the cultural association Matica Slovenska's website. This is a kind of right-wing nationalist cultural organization citing reports from the time, he wrote that during the war, quote, non-Jewish children from the poorest families did not have enough money for bread and cried with hunger. Their mothers stood for hours in front of dairy stores and either got very little or no milk at all. But Jewish women got milk with a doctor's prescription. In the same way, Jews got 70, 80 per, 70 to 80% of the available meat, even though they represented only about 10% of the population. 
It was the same with other types of food because of the black market trading that most Jews were involved in. Their public consumption of nuts and chocolate, which non-Jewish citizens could not buy at any price, aroused great resentment. While the others had to work hard for their meager food and clothing, the Jews were rarely to be seen on public works." End quote. The following year, the Slovak National Party put Bielek forward as a candidate to replace Langos as the head of the nation's memory institute. Though neither PV ZPKO candidate won that position, in 2009, Parliament did elect Tarnoji to the supervisory board of the nation's memory institute. This stirred controversy both domestically and abroad. In response, Tarnoji denied being a supporter of the wartime state. To get a better sense of the PV ZPKO's orientation, I examined the message Svedetstvo, his journal, communicates regarding the wartime fascist state. <coughs> Review of the first six, six issues in 2013 of Svedetstvo gives a swift answer. All but one of them included one or more positive articles on the wartime Slovak state. To begin with, Tarnoji contributed to, to, to the April issue, noting some auspicious associations with the date March 14th, which was the date that the, Slovak, the wartime Slovak state was founded, including the commemoration of Saints Cyril and Methodius, who had brought Christianity to the Slavs. Tarnoji asks, quote, maybe it was God's guidance or just a coincidence of events that on March 14, 1939, the first Slovak state in modern times was declared and recognized, end quote. The suggestion that the state was founded under divine direction would seem to indicate a fairly deep-seated respect for its legitimacy. Other recent Svedetsvo pieces defend celebration of the state's founding. <coughs> While some do not deny the, st the state's history um, includes persecution and genocide, though there is some downplaying and equivocation, and equivocation, others defend convicted war criminals and cast doubt on the state's role in crimes against humanity. For example, in an article titled Struggle, Struggle for the Memory of the Nation, historian Martin Latsko refers to Ferdinand Jatonsky, who as the wartime state's first minister for uh, home and foreign affairs was behind numerous pieces of uh, anti-Semitic legislation refers to him as the alpha and omega of Slovak independence. Noting that Derchansky and others have been unfairly maligned as war criminals, he argues that the, quote, tragedy of the Jewish community is being misused against everything positive that the first Slovak Republic was. It is always pulled out as the joker card at the mention of the positive features of the state, likely in an attempt to make it just a kind of subset of the Holocaust, and the Holocaust is in quotation marks. Other articles make the same point. <coughs> the evidence is sufficient to conclude that the associations of Slovak political prisoners, and especially the PVZPKO since their split, have played a dual role in Slovak transitional justice, both advancing the claims of the many victims of the communist state and degrading those of the wartime state. What are the implications of these findings for understanding the relationship between civil society and transitional justice in Slovakia and more broadly? To begin, it adds another possibility to back our set of relationships between civil society and the state, as both civil society and political will for transitional justice were weak going into the transition, a scenario that he doesn't discuss. The role of the media played also expands the list of possible civil society contributions that Backer provides. Second, the Slovak case complicates the state society dichotomy that is sharply drawn in some conceptualizations of civil society, as Tarnoji has a foot in each realm. To the extent that a supervisory role at the nation's memory institute both requires and brings with it some moral and scholarly authority, it could in turn strengthen the legitimacy of the PVZPKO's positive portrayal of the fascist state in, this, in the public eye. Moreover, the election of Langos's successors shows that many Slovak leaders remain unwilling to unequivocally denounce the, the fascist state and its president, Monsignor Josef Tiso. The first was Ivan Petransky, who publicly stated his respect for Tiso. In 2013, the ruling Smer Party's candidate for Petransky's successor, Yuri Kalina, was welcomed across the board as a particularly good candidate. Shortly before the parliamentary vote, Kalina gave a uh, an interview to um, Political Weekly, or sorry, Political Daily SME. Asked whether there was anything to respect about Tiso, he responded, quite the contrary. And when he was asked if he would attend a celebration of the, the state's founding, he said, certainly not. Shortly after, Smer dropped its support of Kalina, and one Smer MP admitted that some of his colleagues had taken issue with his statements about the wartime state. 
Ultimately, Parliament elected a candidate from within the nation's memory institute, Andrei Krajniak, who does not unequivocally condemn the wartime state. The evidence is clear that elements of both state and civil society, with boundaries between them blurry, are trying to influence the national memory, but to what effect? A partial answer can be found in a January 2013 poll investigating both Slovak knowledge and opinion about the 1939 to 1945 period. The research found that positive perception of TISO <coughs> had dropped from 25% in 1993 to 14%. That said, only 59.9% .9 of respondents could name TISO as a key political figure of the wartime state. 53.6% said that they don't know, had never heard of, the term Aryanization, which the, was the term for the confiscation of Jewish property. And only 15.3% gave the correct answer, which is 50 to 80,000, to the question of how many Jews had been deported to concentration camps, with 48.9% responding they didn't know or had never heard. Notably, between one half and two thirds of respondents between the ages of 18 and 24 said, I don't know, to the poll questions. According to sociologist Olga Gyefarsheva, that shows, quote, that shows that schools teach little about the wartime Slovak state, and they do it wrong, end quote. This is not due to insufficient information and scholarship. Rather, according to the director of the Holocaust Documentation Center, quote, the problem is that the, slo the social and expert discourse about this historical period is divided into two camps. One critically evaluates and analyzes it, while those from the other trivialize the responsibility of the wartime Slovak state's representatives for the events that took place, and thus also for the Holocaust in Slovakia." End quote. Productive discussion between those camps has not occurred. It is clear to which camp the PVZPKO belongs. Based on the polling data, it seems that its efforts have resulted less in the reorientation of Slovak views on the wartime state and more installing the societal grappling with the past. This raises a final implication of the Slovak case regarding the issue of the normative expectations of civil society. Here it is worth recalling Adam Seligman's distinction between civil society as an analytic idea and as a normative ideal. The normative expectations could be understood in a couple of ways. First, they could concern the orientation of civil society as current actors assuming them to be generally supportive of liberal democratic values. This is a highly idealistic vision, and it is easy to think of examples of citizens' associations that are not. Still, the civil society actors discussed in the transitional justice literature tend to be ones that fit that profile. The Slovak case indicates that assumptions about such an orientation should, at a minimum, be questioned. A second set of normative expectations is more complex holding that the contestation between ideas and interests that occurs in civil society is likely to ultimately help the reasonable, responsible positions to win out, and in the interaction, to increase respect for participatory democracy. The Slovak case also challenges these assumptions. On the one hand, the Slovak media's participation in the discussion of the secret police files and political prisoners' advocacy for restitution has been vital. In addition, the debate over the wartime state produced a history vastly superior to the one that prevailed during the communist period when civil society was repressed. On the other hand, it is striking that a group pushing for the recognition of serious human rights violations committed by one regime takes a public stand against the full recognition of violations committed by an earlier regime. A civil society group's involvement in transitional justice does not, therefore, in itself justify a presumption that the group is more broadly oriented in favor of universal human rights. Moreover, careful public discussion and clear evidence have not produced the kind of consensus that some civil society theorists expect to arise out of political communication among associations, where the most convincing arguments win out. Neither has the relevant evidence been incorporated into the educational system in a way that would allow younger generations to become responsible citizens. It would seem that open-mindedness, strong reasoning, and good judgment among most key players would be necessary for such an outcome. And the Slovak case makes clear that this is not always the case. Thus, the Slovak case supports backers' arguments about the kinds of important roles that civil society organizations may play, but it also expands their range in a cautionary way. 
While they may be supportive of transitional justice for certain victims and seek to expose and illuminate some elements of a society's dark past, they may seek to whitewash or shroud others. And while representing and promoting the interests of one set of his previous regime's victims, may attempt to keep the victims of other oppressive, even genocidal regimes from achieving a just portrayal in the national memory. Thus, while the analytic idea of civil society is useful and important for studying transitional justice actors and outcomes, its relationship to any normative ideal cannot be assumed. Simply put, there is no reason to expect civility from civil society. Thank you. Thank you.